Thanks, uh, gentlemen. Thanks for all, all of you for being here. It's a fascinating conversation, minute by minute. Um, it leads to new questions, at least on my behalf. And I think about the one, the most recent one on accountability of the president. And uh, you know, I hate to bring up the sore subject of Ben Rhodes, but I don't see any accountability. I mean, I see Ben Rhodes on uh, uh, on the TV from Laos this week, and uh, I myself wrote the president a letter asking him to relieve Ben Rhodes for his. Uh, for his forays that were that were um, made public. Uh, that having been said, I, I know the 1947 Act doesn't specifically talk about qualifications, but you fine gentlemen who have worked in the industry um, maybe could lead us in the right direction. And I would also say uh, right here that I'm not, not an advocate of Congress meddling too much I in the president's business, and I think that regardless of the president's party or who they, that person is, is that everybody wants to, the president to have the tools that he or she needs to complete the mission. But it's apparent, I think, to most people that this thing is pretty broken uh, for whatever reason, and without any congressional oversight, we're completely relying on the executive to, to make the correct decisions, and, and, and once it gets a level or two below him, it seems, or her, it seems like it's... Uh, the rules are being made up as they go for the expedience of whatever at the moment is the uh, is, is is garnering the attention. So, with that in mind, what what should I looked at Ben Rhodes's qualifications, knowing what he was involved in the level. This is national security. This is national policy that affects millions of lives and and the world, and I and I think that the qualifications for that individual have to be. Profound and robust, in my opinion. I mean, I don't have the qualifications to do what some of these folks are doing, and I wouldn't deign to think that I do. What should they be, and and how does that how does that come about? Anybody? If I could give a perspective, Congressman Perry, I can't answer about individuals in the current administration, but it's been my observation, uh, and I made this in my testimony, that because the agencies. In the, in the national security space are so bloated with so many empowered people doing, doing you name it, um, there's 80 direct reports to the Secretary of State by my count. That's, that's just an unbelievable fact. Um, and I, I would say OSD, OJCS, and as, as Congressman Rohrbacher pointed out, the intel community with, with 800 new billets layered on top of the 16 agencies. So that's out there. Now you have the NSC staff, which has grown into several hundred. And if you could just imagine, and I, we all can try to imagine, the president inside the Oval Office saying, who are all these people? You're getting huge amounts of paperwork from all of these agencies. Then you've got hundreds of people that you met once when they came in to say hello and take your picture. No wonder, I sort of can understand why he'd take five people that he trusts and say, close the door, we'll figure it out sort of a treehouse mentality. I don't mean to be diminished. And, and I would agree with it, you. It's, it's just a, it's a process problem. It, my perception in years past is that it was four or five, ten people that the president trusted, and that's who the NSC was now. It's apparent now that that's who the president, the current president, trusts, and I don't blame him. But who are they, all these other people, and, and what the, why do we need them? What have they got to do with anything? Let me, let me just, what is the NSC's... Uh, what are the responsibility regarding the national security strategy? Anybody? Sure. And, uh, Congressman, I served for a year and a half as the Senior Director, director for Strategic Planning at, at the White House in terms of the creation of the national security strategy of the United States, which is, happens once every three years or so. But you know what the statute is, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. So, so in eight years now, we'll have it done twice when it's required every single year. Sure, and administrations, I mean, un unfortunately, as someone who owned the strategic planning operation uh, or ran it, uh, I would have wanted to see it done more often. But it's traditionally been done going back to when the statute was created, I think, twice in an administration. Bush did it twice. I think Clinton did it twice. Uh, actually, did it more than twice. But So do we need a change in the standard? since apparently we can't abide by the standard? No, or I, I to, What are the consequences of not abiding by the a, standard? I, poor policy, yeah, right? Poor I, I execution. I believe there should be more strategic thinking uh, in the White House. I very much applaud that uh, recommendation, the Atlanta Council's report. As I said, we tried mightily to give our senior policymakers more time to think strategically and get out of the inbox, but the press of events has been uh, uh, unrelenting. And just very quickly, if I could, sir. So Ray, do you have a, go ahead. Can, can, Hold that thought for a minute and then continue it afterward. But do you have a recommendation regarding that? To me, 
one of the bigger issues is that we have all these new people, all these great minds. We can't even get a national security strategy out. How does the national military uh, strategy follow no national security strategy? How does anybody know what the plan is? I, I think one of the most important things that a new administration can do is to try to get the sequencing right and how they do these strategies, because no administration has gotten it right, where you start with a national security strategy, then you do the QDR, then you do the QDDR, and then you do all the other uh, uh, sort of agency-level strategies. And unfortunately, because of different oversight committees, different processes in the different departments, those are not well aligned, and it doesn't make much sense. I concede that. Can I just say very briefly, because uh, not to get into individuals, but I should. Ben Rhodes is a, is a friend and colleague. I worked with him very closely during my time in the administration. He's one of the most talented people I've worked with in Washington. I've worked here for 20 years with a lot of talented people. That said, both the DOD, state, and at the NSC, there are a lot of folks that I worked with who were the best in the business, and there are a lot of folks I worked with, or some, I should say, that I worked with, and I wondered how they got there. Uh, this goes back to a question that was, I was given earlier that I didn't get a chance to answer, which was, there isn't really any quality training done really in any of the positions in, in the national security field. Outs basically, once you get out of school, or if you're in the career of foreign service, or in the military, you get a chance to do a stint at NDU. I think that's something we should take very seriously. I believe in past authorization bills uh, for the State Department, that issue has been looked at, sort of career professional training. Um, but to ensure that we do have a higher standard in all of our agencies for senior officials. Well, let me just conclude with this, Mr. Chairman. Um, regardless of Ben Rhodes' talents, and I acknowledge he seems like a very talented individual but what I've read and what I've seen, nothing Nothing at all regarding his talent uh, explains or justifies deceiving the American people uh, outwardly, uh, regardless of, of the policy outcome. The ends do not justify the means, and, uh, and I find it reprehensible, unacceptable, and I think it's a black mark on the administration on, and on American policy, and that's my opinion. But with that, I yield back.